Hi, welcome to Life Hurts, God Heals. I'm one of your hosts, Kim Ward. And I'm your other host, Kurt Flagel. And on this second part of our two-part series on hermeneutics, we are actually diving into a traditionally controversial passage to put the tools we talked about last time into practice. So join us right now as we take a deep dive into 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8-15. through 15. But first, let's start with an overview of hermeneutics to recap our last episode. Practices, spiritual practices, means we keep trying them. And in any practice in a sport, you do the same thing over and over and over again until it becomes muscle memory. That's why practicing hermeneutics as you read scripture is so important because over time, you begin to retrain and reframe your mind. Am I thinking about the author and who they're writing to? Am I thinking about the context of this whole passage, even though I'm only reading 10 verses? Do I remember what the context was? Well, maybe I just should go back and do a quick read-through of, of this whole section that will help me. That takes time. And God meets us when we slow down and be still. So basic hermeneutics are here to help us slow down and hear the voice of God more clearly. I think maybe we should do a little practice of this just to get these down. So the idea again is basic hermeneutics. Who wrote the book? When was the book written? What group of people was the book addressing? What is the purpose or overall theme of the book? And make sure you keep what you're reading in context with the bigger picture of the theme of that chapter or that book. And if you get stuck and are confused, or maybe you think you have an understanding of a particularly difficult passage, take the time to Google other Bible verses that are about that same theme and research them. So interpret scripture with scripture as well. Okay, let's take a little time and practice what we're talking about so people get an idea of how this can flow. We'll do a small passage, but a pretty controversial one. Not necessarily, you know, trying to change people's minds, but see that there can be other interpretations from what we think they are if we don't practice hermeneutics. Sounds like a plan. Okay, First Timothy chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 8 and go to the end of the chapter. So, this is the Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, roughly. He's writing to a guy named Timothy, hence the name of the book, who happens to be one of the people he has discipled and invested in and is now pastoring a church. So, he's writing to Timothy and he says, I desire... This is in verse 8. He says, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness, with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. At first glance, without doing anything that we have talked about, what does it look like Paul is saying here? Yeah, pick something easy, why don't you, Kurt? <laughs> well, that's the point. We want to show how this can be helpful and with difficult passages. Yeah. I mean, I know how this has been used to justify saying that women can't teach in church or be in any position of authority at least not in a position where she's in authority over men. Here's what's interesting about that. Mm -hmm. I personally, and this is my my personal experience only, as a finite human being, anytime I've heard a message teaching this, 
in the way that you just described. In my personal experience, I have never heard the teacher explain verse 15. Hmm. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. We just talked about part of basic hermeneutics is taking the whole passage in context. That verse is in the passage, in the flow of, of what Paul is saying here. So we, if we're going to understand what he's talking about here, we need to understand and explain verse 15. I have yet to hear that in a message, me personally. So right there is a violation of basic hermeneutics and all the messages I've heard on this passage. Although to be fair, 15 also gets taken out of context and used to of shaming women who haven't had kids. Interesting. That's a perspective I wasn't thinking about. Being single, 39, and without kids or any plan of having kids, that one might possibly smack me in the face just a <laughs> tiny bit. I want to go back to something you said earlier, which I think is very important. Mm -hmm. And that is prayer is key. And as you're reading scripture, prayer doesn't necessarily need to be words, but an attitude of being aware of God's presence. So right now, as we're talking about this, I realize we have yet to pray on air, at least as, as we're reading this passage. So God, yeah, just we ask you to help us be open to whatever it is you are wanting us to see in this, understanding that you're infinite and we're finite, which means as finite human beings, we all have a, a finite perspective that we approach scripture with. So we need your infinite perspective. We ask for it as we read this. We also ask for your humility to stay open to seeing new things and allowing you to walk us slowly through the mystery of this. Thank you that we don't have to have all the answers in one sitting. Thank you that you are patient with us to meet us where we are. So we receive your patience and your love in this moment. Amen. Amen. Okay. One of the ways that we know to interpret scripture is with understanding the whole passage to understand the flow. So to understand 15, we're going to move to a later thought in the same flow from Paul, which is 1 Timothy 4, and we're just going to read the first few verses. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer." Here's a, a little key that will help us understand 15 and therefore help us put the context of what he's writing about in that passage in 1 Timothy 2. There are liars who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving. What is Paul talking about? This is what knowing the culture, knowing what's happening comes in. In that time, a growing heresy, what would later become known as Gnosticism, mm -hmm. which was a marriage of Greek philosophy and Christian beliefs. Greek philosophy says that everything spiritual is good and everything physical bad. And so Gnostics took that idea and brought it into their beliefs when it comes to Jesus. At this point, it hadn't risen to being called Gnosticism, but it was, it was starting to, to develop. So these teachers are basically saying anything physical is bad, so you can't get married and have kids, and you have to abstain from foods. So you have to deny the physical body because that is bad, but everything spiritual is good. What is a belief system today that says that every spirit is good? Uh, the New Age movement. The New Age movement. Part of that comes from Greek philosophy. At its core, it has no discernment of spirits. So see how dangerous this could be. Go back to 15. 
Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Now that we have a context that these people were teaching women, the true faith was to not get married, not have kids, and not eat certain foods. And they're buying into these false teachings and getting off track from what truly is the good news of Jesus. Now, reading that in that context, what does that tell us? What does it mean that she will be saved through childbearing? Kim, what did you say earlier is true knowledge? Experience. Experience. Walking it out in obedience and seeing other people obey and walk it out. That's real knowledge. Not just knowing it head, but hearing God's voice and obeying what he says one step at a time. That's really what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Pursuing intimacy with God to hear his voice and then obeying him one step at a time. So what Paul is saying, you will see the evidence of the saving knowledge of their faith of these women, that they're coming back into alignment with the saving knowledge of Jesus and refuting these false teachings by their willingness to get married, have kids, and reject these false teachings. That's what he's talking about in the context of the culture and the full view of 1 Timothy 2 through 4, he is talking about a bunch of women who have been deceived. It could be interpreted that there's a a deeper issue of who's primarily responsible for the failure of these women to be taught correctly. Like when we read verse 13, Mm -hmm. for Adam was formed first, then Eve in 14, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Who does it sound like that Paul is placing the blame on there? Uh, The women. Yes. But notice he says something very interesting. Context, right? And interpreting scripture with scripture. For Adam was formed first. That's an interesting statement. Go to Genesis chapter 2. Okay, let's interpret scripture with scripture. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And this is where Eve is created. So here we see what Paul is saying. Adam was formed first. Now we see another context of what he means that Adam was formed first. Being formed first, Adam was the one given the command to not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In that command, we have no place in scripture where where God tells Eve this. So what are we seeing here that relates to what Paul is saying? Who was responsible for teaching Eve, who wasn't even around yet, not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Adam was responsible to to teach Eve. So go back to 1 Timothy 2. Interpreting scripture with scripture, maybe we have a fuller interpretation of this passage, or at least the possibility of another interpretation that maybe the responsibility that Paul is putting on somebody's shoulders isn't Eve's responsibility. She's not the one who's primarily responsible for her deception. He says, for Adam was formed first. Primary responsibility. Adam was the one God gave the responsibility to. Then Eve And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. We don't have time, but if you go look at Genesis 3, when Eve eats from the tree, when she engages with the serpent who tells her that God is a liar Mm -hmm. and that she won't die, and she sees the, the fruit is good for eating, and she goes and takes some and eats it, it says she turns and gives some to the man who is right there with her. So, who failed in the responsibility first? Adam. He could have stopped her. He could have spoken up. E- even in that moment, like, hey, this is what God said. Yeah, that's a, a bit of a different interpretation than we normally put on it. Right. And I'm not saying that this is the most accurate 
interpretation. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm making here is a point to say, if you follow hermeneutics, you may come up with something that will surprise you, that will change your viewpoint, or make you think and really sit with this and see things differently. And so the extrapolation of this could be that Paul isn't talking about women not ever being able to teach or have authority. It could be he's saying, men, you have failed to disciple women, and therefore they're being deceived, so they're not in a place to teach because you have not prepared them well. That could be a possibility of what's being said here. There's more to, to look at. There's other scriptures to bring into the discussion. Right in 1 Timothy, there's the requirements for elders that could be brought in this discussion. We could also bring in the scriptures where the first witnesses of Jesus' resurrection are women. Here's another cultural thought in a culture where women were not allowed to bear witness in the Jewish court of law. And Jesus deliberately shatters that cultural dynamic by making women his first witnesses to the greatest miracle of human history, the resurrection from the dead. So here's a question to bring that into the discussion along with the idea of an elder being a man of, of one wife and being good with his children. Bring that into the discussion. What is Jesus really showing us through his actions, by letting women be witnesses. And then the angel's telling them, go tell the men. Go be witnesses to the men. See how important hermeneutics are to interpreting scripture correctly so we may walk in it. All of these things bring up other ideas that we have to wrestle through. And I think what you said is important. We have to bring God into the process and ask him to help us. Sometimes we're so hardened in our point of view because we've been taught it through our church or our culture, and we don't even recognize we're resistant and we're not open to allowing the Holy Spirit to give us other interpretations. So this is all this is for. We're not here to tell people what to believe. We are here to help people be open to tools that can help them be more sensitive to God's voice as they pray and as they read scripture, to slow down and be still and know that he is God. Yeah, that's a huge thing for, for us with any of this stuff. There's, there's a lot of things in the Bible that can be hard to understand. I mean, the church has done a bang up job the last 2000 years of managing to disagree with each other on a regular basis because we're the finite beings trying to understand the infinite. And it can be one of the frustrating things sometimes that God didn't just come out clear on every single thing. This is the way. But we talked about before that beauty of mystery, that invitation to come to God with open hands and an open mind and an open heart and go, God, I don't understand this. This is hard. I know what my church has taught me. I know what I know what my lenses are on some of this. And this particular passage for me was one that I had to wrestle with a lot because I grew up in churches where where women weren't allowed to teach, where they weren't allowed to be the pastor. You could have a woman youth minister because I was teaching kids. I wasn't teaching adults. And they made that distinction very clear. And for me then coming to a point of having had someone give me a prophetic word that said, you're going to be a pastor, then wrestling through all these different things over the years going, God, well, how does this tie in? Like, it feels like everything I've been taught growing up says that can't possibly be for you. And on the other hand, hearing him very clearly multiple times, because I'm not stubborn at all, going, hey, I want you to do this. And having to come to a point where I'm like, okay, well... Now I have to come to you with open hands with this because I know there are huge sections of Christianity that do believe that women can be pastors and be in leadership. That's not my background. God, how do I interpret this? Can you show me what, what you say? You know, because I don't want to be disobedient to your word, but I keep feeling like I'm hearing something different that doesn't line up with my current understanding. Again, to emphasize what we're saying here is not where you land on, right. on this topic. 
important on these scriptures. It is simply to be open and to practice these things to let God speak to you and let him lead you on that path. And in all of this, there's such a, a beautiful lesson of, of God's character that just keeps rising to the surface as I'm listening to you and as we're talking, is that is God's infinite patience. This goes against our need to have all the answers and get it all figured out and allows us to relax and go on the journey because we are people who are finite and God is infinite, which means his patience with us is infinite even when we're not at the place where we're in alignment with him on an idea or at least in alignment with him for us and what he's calling us to, he's patient. So we can take the time and make room to read scripture at a slower pace. Doesn't mean we'll do it every day, you know, and that when we're not doing it every day, that God is somehow impatient with us. He's patient. He meets us where we are and he goes at our speed. And that's a relaxing thought that's meant to help us relax and meet him where he is meeting us. So speaking of that, would you mind praying for everyone listening, including me and you, to be more relaxed and be more open to allowing God to meet us where we are with his infinite patience and love? Sure, why not? God, thank you so much that you are always speaking to us that you are always pursuing, that there's no point where we turn around and find you vanished or having left. Dad, help us. We need your Holy Spirit to guide us when it comes to your word. Dad, you're infinite and we are finite and we only see a small part of what you're doing. And even that we mostly don't understand. Dad, when it comes to this, I just ask that you would let us come to you with open hands and open hearts and open minds, that we'd be willing to lay down our own lenses and our own backgrounds and our own culture and let you speak to us who you are and who we are to you in a way that is where we don't necessarily have to have all of the answers. Dad, you are the best mystery out there, and it's a mystery that draws us in. Dad, that we would be in a place where you are allowed to speak through your scripture to us, whatever it is, whether it's comfortable or uncomfortable for us, that we wouldn't give up after just one try, that we would be willing to pursue you and keep pursuing you, that we would keep asking, keep seeking, and keep knocking, because with you it's never a one-time event. There's never some point where we have it all figured out. As much as that frustrates us, that's also a wonderful thing. Because it means there's always more. Dad, you are the God of more than enough. The God who invites us further up and further in always. Dad, that we would just come to you with open hands with this. Yeah, that's that's just the thing. That we wouldn't be so tightly gripping what we think we understand. But that we'd be willing to let you change us. And mold us and shape us as only you can do. Dad, I just bless everyone listening with that openness with your rest and with your patience, knowing that you are always patient with us and you're not disappointed in us or frustrated with us when we struggle or wrestle, but that that's what delights your heart as a tad wrestling with his kids, that we would be willing to be childlike with you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. For those of you who've been listening, we want to thank you. We really appreciate you being on the journey with us. If you want more help on that journey, you have questions or you have prayer requests, you can always reach out to us for whatever reason through our Facebook page, Life Hurts God Heals, or on YouTube, you can find us. We have a channel there, Life Hurts God Heals, and you can leave comments or message us through that. Or you can email me, Kurt at Elevate Slow. That's Kurt at Elevate S-L-O dot church. And as always... We want to leave you with this blessing. From God's perspective, he says you are his beloved. So be loved.